Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, and welcome to another episode of the Heart Healthy Hustle podcast show. I'm your host, Jonathan Frederick, and I am glad you're here. On this show, I talk with industry-leading experts about connecting with others, impacting your niche, and striving to live the best life possible. It's all about sparking meaningful conversations around business ownership and entrepreneurship. The Heart Healthy Hustle Show is about finding connection with proactive peers and navigating a healthy work life with full autonomy. So whether you're driving to or from work right now, exercising, eating, or just relaxing, come hang out and get ready to enjoy another inspiring episode of the Heart Healthy Hustle Show. All right, guys, welcome back to another episode of the Heart Healthy Hustle Show. I'm your host, Jonathan Frederick. Today here with another very special guest, we have Mark Sanborn, author of The Fred Factor, How Passion in Your Work and Life Can Turn the Ordinary into the Extraordinary. Mark is the author of eight books that sold more than 1.6 million copies internationally. Mark holds the Certified Speaking Professional designated for the National Speakers Association and is a member of the Speaker Hall of Fame. Mark's list of over 2,400 clients include Costco, Enterprise Rent-A-Car, FedEx, Harley-Davidson, Hewlett-Packard, Cisco, ESPN, and IBM, to name a few. Mark is a noted expert on leadership, team building, and customer service and change. So, Mark, I've been excitedly anticipating the opportunity to talk with you. I'm glad to have you here. Thanks, Jonathan. Yeah, you know, if you live long enough, you can do all that stuff. That's the uh, that's the secret is persistence and old age. Yeah, Mark, so go ahead and fill in any gaps from that intro and give us a brief glimpse into your personal life. Sure. Well, that was a great intro. Thank you. I've been a full-time professional speaker for 31 years. That is the point of my revenue arrow or my model. And then uh, I write books and also have uh, some training products that we make available online and some that we custom develop for some of our clients. So basically, I'm in the idea business. You know, we're all in the idea business. It's all about how we apply the ideas that we find. For me, it's in speaking and writing and advising others. I guess with the success of the Fred Factor, which really came kind of midway through my speaking career, one of the areas that I've worked on a great deal since that book came out in 2004 is how to turn the ordinary into the extraordinary. Because the idea is, you know, we wake up every day, we all have ordinary lives. Very few of us, unless we were born into some kind of outrageously uh, wealthy family or amazing circumstance, you know, all we have is ordinary moments and we choose whether to keep them ordinary or do something that will occasionally uh, make those moments and the interactions we have extraordinary. So that's my uh, background. Personally, I grew up on a dairy farm in Northeast Ohio, moved to Colorado for the simple reason I wanted to live here. Love the mountains. I uh, used to ski a whole lot, but going back to my opening comment, another thing about getting older is you find that certain body parts that you used a lot start to wear out. So my knees uh, no longer are as, I don't enjoy skiing as much as the rest of my body does, but uh, live here with my family. I have a son at Ohio State University and a, a son who's a senior in high school my wife, Darla. So that's the Reader's Digest version. Thanks for asking. Thank you for sharing that. Go ahead and share with my audience your favorite success quote or saying you live by and what it means to you. Well, my favorite quotes kind of change over time. I have a lot of favorite quotes, but G.K. Chesterton had perhaps one of the shortest but most inspirational for me. He said, the world will never lack for wonders, only wonder. And if you think about that, what he was saying is, is we live in a fascinating world. So if you're bored, it isn't because there's nothing to be fascinated by. It's because you're just not curious or interested anymore. And w- when my boys were young, they grew up in the age of technology. They like like every generation that comes after the generation before. They had amazing opportunities enabled by discoveries and technology. But they would still, like we all do, say, "Oh, I'm bored." And I always made it a point to tell them. Probably it's one of those things they'll tease me about when they're older. I used to say boredom is a choice. It's not a condition. If you're bored, it's because you choose to be bored. There's so many things that could keep you interested if you were only willing to, to be interested. I'm just letting that soak in a little bit. Go ahead and share how you transitioned from struggling to find your purpose at a younger age to now a, st- a strong, structured man of vision. Well, I, I hope I'm a, a man of vision, a person of vision. I I think that's the kind of thing that's more often bestowed by others than claimed by the person themselves. But for me, it, there were really two steps. One is, is I'm a person of faith. That really gives me a sense of purpose. And, you know, I recognize not everyone believes the same way that I do. And that's the beauty of diversity and a difference of opinion. We can all learn from each other. Uh, but for me, my deepest sense of purpose derives from my faith. Ecclesiastes, it says, you know, so here is the, the final conclusion fear God and keep his commandments. Of course, that word fear 
uh, gets translated as, you know, be afraid. But really what that means is much more a sense of keep a sense of wonder. Certainly respect is part of it, but it's also wonderment, not just uh, being afraid. So that's important. But then, you know, the other part of it is I had a friend some years ago who said, you know, and he was my age, still still is my age, I guess. It's not like I got ahead of him. He, <laughs> he said, uh, I, I've never had uh, been able to find a singular sense of purpose. What do I do? And I said, well, the best advice I can give you is if you don't have a singular purpose, do everything purposefully. And what I mean by that is, is, is as important as an overarching purpose is, everything we do can have an individual sense of purpose. Like maybe my interaction with my spouse or my girlfriend or my boyfriend, maybe the purpose of that interaction isn't to be a mindless exchange of, of, of words, but I want to make sure he or she knows how much I appreciate the other. Maybe it's a, a sales call where I don't have this overarching purpose that, you know, if I make this sales call, the commission will allow me to allow me to open an orphanage in Nigeria. It might, but more likely it's just going to be a successful sales call. And maybe your purpose there is to really help the client to get around the idea that it's got to be about making the sale. Maybe you don't make the sale, but the client's more successful because you gave them some information or pointed them in a direction that benefited them. So for me, having a sense of purpose is important, but doing things purposefully is, is even more important. And by the way, you don't, you don't have to do everything purposefully. Be silly to be sitting there at your desk doing your expense account and trying to imbue this big, crazy sense of worldview into it. You know, some things you just need to do and get done. But the important things you want to do purposefully. That's one of the main things that I really admire you for is how you stand for that message of doing things purposefully and not simply doing things with a lack of purpose simply because you don't see yourself maybe in that job position for a long period of time. For me personally, I've always, always, when I'm doing a job, any anything, no matter what, even if I don't see myself there for a long time, always doing it purposefully as opposed to I'm not going to be fully present for what I do because I won't be in this job for long. Well, and I, and I say, if you're not happy where you are, you won't be happy where you go next. And what that means is if you're hinging your, your happiness on your external circumstances, then you're going to be in trouble because you're always going to be, whether it's stuck in traffic or working you know, at a job that it isn't fulfilling, there's always going to be an external circumstance that can make you choose to be unhappy. But if you're not happy where you're at, you won't be happy where you're going. And, and that's not some kind of like just motivational happy talk. Uh, you know, we, we ultimately choose. One of my favorite quotes recently, I'll kind of slip in a second quote. Tony McGee is the guy that founded Lagunitas Brewing, and I happen to have a, a high fondness for craft beer. And Tony said something. I read his book about him, how he founded his, his business. He said, uh, and this is maybe one of the shortest, most succinct quotes in history. He said, you are what you've done. And when you think about that, wherever you are today is accumulation of every decision you had, every thought you had, every a action you took, every relationship you started or ended. You know, we are cumulatively today what we've done. But I take that a step further and say, so you'll be what you do. And that is to say, if you change what you do, even a little bit, it changes who you become a little bit. If you change what you do a lot, it changes who you become a lot. And that's that's the whole you know point of intentional living is is not to just sleepwalk through the day and leave hours kind of to default, right? That just happen to you. But to the degree you can without being kooky obsessive, choose to do the things that will make you the person you want to be, that will make you a better person uh, next week and, and next year. Absolutely. So, Mark, switching it up a little bit here, I found on your website that you're an avid motorcyclist. I've, I've ridden for many years. I've had a chance to ride all over the U.S. and uh, Europe. Wow, that is the epic. What's your favorite bike? Well, I have lots of motorcycles I like. I've owned a number of Harley Davidsons, and uh, they're a client. Uh, you know, Harley Davidson is, is not the fastest bike typically, but, you know, there's a certain cachet and charm. Maybe it's an acquired taste, but... I've toured on um, Hondas and I've toured on BMWs and uh, I, but I own Harley Davidsons. Actually, I'm in I'm in between bikes right now, at, uh, but I've owned a half dozen Harley Davidsons over the years. I actually interviewed a gentleman who does um, slow mo videos of riders over at the Mulholland Snake. Oh and yeah, I yeah. To... See, I don't I don't I don't scrape my knees. Uh, I'm I'm too old to be doing that. I'll leave that to the to the younger, more skilled riders. Yeah, Mulholland, it's like world famous for uh, 
course, <laughs> coming down the other lane in a car sometimes gets interesting when somebody doesn't pick their line right and they come a little left to center. That can be a recipe for excitement, if not disaster. What would be uh, one tip for all the motorcyclists out there that you might have for enjoying a long, safe, enjoyable motorcycle lifestyle? You know, vigilance. I mean, I, I wish I could come up with something truly exotic, but you know, most motorcyclists that live long and prosper learn to watch other drivers at a much higher scrutiny than when you're in a car. There are certain kinds of vehicles, and I won't bring them up here because it'll sound like I'm stereotyping, but if you're a motorcyclist, you know <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, and you learn to be vigilant. You can just tell from eye movements whether or not somebody is going to uh, create a potential hazard. The, the old cliche, you've probably had people share it on your show, is casualness creates casualties. And usually that's just metaphoric. But when you're a cyclist, you know, vigilance is so very important. So uh, to, to all my fellow riders, ride safe and live long. I actually just got my license. I'm in the process of saving up for my first bike. Going into your speaking career, Mark, you said you've been speaking now professionally for about 31 years. Well, full time for 31 years, a little longer professionally because I worked my way through college as an after dinner speaker. So if you if you throw in those early low fee gigs, it's well, actually, let's not even go there. It's a big number. I was in college back when Brontosaurus roamed the plains. I'm interested to hear about the day in the life of the college age Mark where he was going to class and those after dinner speeches. Well, it was interesting, and people ask, you know, the obvious question is, you know, why? Why would anybody hire a 19-year-old, 20-year-old guy to come give a speech? Quick background, I was, uh, I started speaking in 4-H at the age of 10. I've written about it in my latest book. I was, my, my first speech was an abject and abysmal failure. I mean, it was the kind of humiliation I can still recall, you know, these many years later. But the good news is it challenged me to learn how to be an effective speaker. Then later, because speaking is such an integral part of leadership, I became a state president, later the national president of FFA, which stands for Future Farmers of America. But today, there are probably more kids in FFA that aren't farm kids than there are that are farm kids. You know, the horticulture, all sorts of, of, of new, per, new pursuits. So when I was a state and, and national president, a lot of people heard me speak when I came to speak to their FFA chapter or their high school. When I was a 19-year-old in college, somebody that had heard me speak at their chapter called and said, we, we have a high school commencement. Would you come speak? I said, Sure, but I charge. Honestly, I just the spirit of free enterprise just seized me, and uh, I'd never charged before, you know. And but I just figured, you know, I was providing a service, and I'd spoken for free a bazillion times. And and the guy says, "So what do you charge?" Well, that was you know that was uh, tough because I hadn't thought that through. And I picked a number, you know, a couple weeks working at at uh, Wendy's, which my roommate in college did. You know, he smelled like a French fry. Yep. Um, it was honest labor, but I thought if I can make that kind of money giving a speech. I said, $150. They said, no problem. And I was like, ah, oh, I love America, right? And so I did these these little 30-minute after-dinner speeches for you know my view of America and patriotism. And frankly, a lot of it was what I call book report speaking. You read a lot. You quoted Zig Ziglar and Jim Rohn and all the legends. And uh, you know, I was kind of a novelty act. And uh, I did these 100 150 200 $250 gigs periodically throughout the year. So you know, I'd get up and go to class and study. And if I if my speech required travel that made me miss a class, then, of course, I had to arrange with my professor or teaching assistant to make it up. And that wasn't that big a deal. I think they some of them might have been a little uh, envious at some young pup was getting paid to speak after dinner because, you know, a lot of a lot of professors consult and, and speak professionally as well. But uh, it worked out. Then I went into the real world of work and I I didn't speak a whole lot back when I was in sales and marketing, mostly because, you know, I had an employer that wasn't keen on me missing work to go give a speech. But at the uh, ripe old age of 27, I, I went full time. OK, really interesting. That goes into my next question. Simply, what would you tell a 25 year old who's proactive, but maybe feeling impatient right now with where their career is? I know you've kind of stuck with something that you've gained mastery in. But these days, you know, especially there's a strong temptation to go ahead and be involved in so many different things. There's endless distractions and can derail momentum, can derail purpose and reaching goals. What would you tell me, a 25-year-old who's proactive but feeling a little impatient? When am I going to find something that you know I really vibe with and that I can really uh, provide a service and a contribution to society with? 
well, I'll start with what I would have told me at 25, and that is relax. You know, I was a pretty, in, still am a pretty intense person. I've just learned to kind of buffer it a bit. I, I like this idea. You got to run fast, but you don't have to run scared. And sometimes, because there's just so many opportunities, you're right. You know, and, and frankly, the younger you are, and, and that's the nice thing about starting out, you have a lot more opportunities. You know, you don't quite usually have the encumberments of spouse or kids or a house or debt. And, and that's really what I did. I, I, I lived a very frugal life because I wanted to be able to travel to speak as much as I could. And the, the thing that helped me when I was in corporate America the most is I tried lots and lots of things. Uh, you'll find that uh, you'll do better if you volunteer, if you have an idea and volunteer to pursue it, than if you wait for somebody in management to come and, and pick you, right? That you may be chosen, but really the way you get chosen is by doing really good work and, and going above and beyond the call of duty. You know, if you only do what the other person in your position's done, you're not creating value. And, and I can say with certainty that regardless of your chosen line or profession, value creators are in high demand. People that can, uh, and I talk about this in a lot of my books, people who can replace money with imagination and outthink a problem, or people who can come up with very inexpensive ways to do things that customers value, you know, that'll make you a rock star whether you stay in corporate uh, America or you do your own deal as an entrepreneur. You know, the, the other thing I would say is uh, look for, look for uh, synergy between the things you do. I've always been a try it kind of person, whether it was bungee jumping 30 years ago when that was a big deal or, you know, whether it was driving a race car on a track or I just I thought it's fun. First of all, when you try a lot of things, you find out what you like and you find out what you don't like and you don't waste time pursuing what you don't like. But all of those things inform the other things. You know, one of the things early on I was known for when I spoke is I was using illustrations that you weren't hearing in most business audiences. So for years, I, I used the illustration of what it's like to be on the edge of a, a bridge where you had 150 feet of space between you and the river below, and you got a bungee cord tied around your ankles. And I, I talked about how do you use that experience to apply it to the rest of your life? You know, and, and really the lesson, if you want to know what it is, it's a lot more interesting when I tell the story, but time precludes that. The real lesson is once you've done all your research and gotten all your facts, I, I checked out the bungee jump operator. I'd done research. I knew it was safe. I knew it was scary, but I knew it was safe. You know, once you reach that point, the only thing left is to leap. And what happens is people sometimes prepare past the point of prudence, right? They just, they keep preparing, keep preparing, keep hesitating, saying, I'll do it next week. I'll come back. You know, and the world pretty much belongs to those people who don't leap off stuff uninformed and realize there's no bungee and there's rocks below. But the people who really did their homework and they go, no, you know what? I'm ready. And they just leap. And so I, I always look for how can what I'm doing inform if it's a board I serve on, if it's an upstart company I invest in. I look at my life as kind of a, a funnel and everything can potentially inform or, or enhance everything else. That's powerful. And one thing I do enjoy talking about on this show is gaining permission for yourself, giving yourself permission to fail and learn and fail and learn and fail and learn. What can you add to that? You know, I find even for myself, I'll be like, all right, I'm ready. I'm very analytical. So I'll do what you just said. I'll over prepare a little bit. You know, all the TED Talks, all the podcasts, the list goes on books on books. And there comes a point where you had just like you mentioned, you just have to leap. Yeah, I, I call it, you know, productive output for all the input. If in my new book, The Potential Principle, I talk about people who are big into thinking and reflection. And I say, you know, if you reflect too much, you become a navel gazer. If you think too much, you become a daydreamer. Any strength overused can become a weakness. And we all have our preferences, right? So, you know, I, I employed a guy, and by the way, he's doing great. These many years later, he's an entrepreneur, he has his own business. But I had an intern many, many years ago, and he was supposed to be basically helping grow my business and create bookings. But mostly what he did was read the books and listen to the tapes that I had in my extensive library because he was he was a junkie. I mean, a self-help junkie, right? And there was nothing wrong with that. But I said to him one day, I said, you know what? You've got to go from input to output. You're smarter than the average person just by the fact that you've 
you know, read everything. And but now it's time to apply that stuff. You don't, you, you've got to. You, if you just have input with no output, you're not a productive person. So you're right. You got to ask yourself, what's the ratio between my input and output? And you got to look for a logical outlet, or else you just become kind of a, a bloated intellect. Bloated intellect. I like that. <laughs> this is something I'm curious about as well. I would love to talk more about the story you mentioned with the bungee cord. What would you tell somebody who's a new speaker? And maybe they have a gift for it, but it's, you know, they're still feeling a little bit insecure because they are newer. Well, I mean, first time you try anything, you feel insecure. And and really, I would say don't – if you have an, an aptitude or a gift for public speaking, that alone won't take you as far as being a student of the craft will. You, you, you may have a predisposition but to play basketball, but if you don't shoot a lot of baskets, you're never going to go very far in the game. So I'll say, you know, first of all, whenever I listen to a speaker, you know, there's two ways to listen to a speaker, you know, and that is learn what he or she's saying. What's their message? You know, what's your pastor trying to tell you? What's the speaker trying to impart? But I always listen from a standpoint of what are they doing right? What are they doing wrong? You know, you can learn little things and sometimes big things, even from sucky speakers, because you go, wow, you know, why, why were they so bad? And then you say, ah, you know, they were all over the map. There was no logical flow of ideas or they pace too much or they use the word, you know, the words, you know, too much. So I want to say watch other speakers. But and then the, the but the final warning is, is. Emulate to learn, but you innovate to earn. If you only copy other speakers, you'll never, if you want to be a pro, if you want to be reimbursed, you'll never go very far. It's when you bring your authenticity, you bring your uniqueness, whether it's the stories you tell or how you communicate or your background, it's when you combine your uniqueness with the uh, the principles of good speaking, that's when you make it big. Hmm. What's your most impressive speaking story? Well, yeah, I mean, I've been gratified uh, to have people be touched in different ways or affected in different ways. You know, I one of the most memorable is um, I had a speech shortly after 9-11 in uh, Reno, Nevada, and the meeting planner uh, for that speech that I'd been working with was on the airplane that went into the Pentagon. And so I that was the first speech I was able to make because, you know, the airports were closed for a few days. I was supposed to be in Boston on 9-11 when when that happened. I was in an airport getting ready to board a plane. So I would say speaking with both the gravity of what had happened in 9-11 and being able to, in a small way, honor her. She uh, at the you know, this woman had a uh, was a single mom, had a high school age son and and, uh, we established that day by we I simply mean the people in the audience and and I was one of them scholarship for her son boy that that still you know makes the hair on the back of my neck stand up when I think about that I used to tell a story about Jean-Dominique Barbet If, if you've never read the book The Diving Bell and the Butterfly it's one of the most amazing stories you'll ever read the gist of it is is Jean Dominique Barbet had locked in syndrome which is where your brain is fully functioning and your your cognition is high, but you're paralyzed. And I mean, totally, you're basically a brain trapped inside a body. And the only thing he could do was to blink his, I think it was his, his left eye. And he dictated this book about being locked in, right? And, you know, and the way you say, well, how did, how did he do that? He had an assistant who would, they took the letters of the alphabet and arranged them in, I guess, frequency of usage. And then she would point at a letter. He could see, obviously, through his left eye. And and when she got to the letter he wanted, he blinked. So he basically typed very slowly, very laboriously, until he wrote this book. And basically, the book said, and this, but the book came out, ironically, just just right before he passed. But he said, I'm, I'm alive and my life in many ways is richer than it was when I was fully able because now I've been forced to go into my mind and, you know, I can't eat, but I can relive the great meals I've had. And some of those meals I never thought about, you know, I just took them for granted and I, I can't embrace a lover, but I can remember what, what my lover's embrace was like. And, and I told this story and the whole idea here is that I hope none of us ever face that. But as long as we're conscious, you know, we've got that potential within us. And this woman left the back, left the meeting. And she was sobbing. And I'm like, oh, boy, uh, you know, what what's that about? Well, make a long story short, since nobody knows this woman or even the audience, uh, she had a loved one that was on life support. And her family at that moment was deciding whether or not to remove life support. And for her. She she 
confirm it confirmed for her that it was worth waiting that, that that this loved one might still have that that cognition even though they were unable to respond and and I do not know uh, the rest of the story but wow you know the power of a story words you know people say the power of words well yeah but words by themselves don't have nearly as much power as a story does so those are two really for me top of mind memorable things that have come out of my uh, work with audiences Fantastic. Really appreciate the insight you're providing. We're going to go ahead and jump into the Heart Healthy Hustle round, where I will ask a series of rapid fire questions. I think there should be like a buzzer or a bell if, <laughs> if it's the hustle round, yeah. but, but uh, lacking that. Ding, ding. Yep. Like, yeah. like in uh, like a boxing <laughs> match or something. Are you ready for the Heart Healthy Hustle round, Mark? I am. The first category is heart. So what is your favorite activity for strengthening your internal character? At the beginning is reading and reflection. If you live life going 100 miles with your hair on fire, you're not learning anything and, and you're not improving. So uh, I'm a big fan. I'm a, a voracious reader. However, I don't just read uh, to be entertained. You know, I, I try to read to retain and I reflect on what I read and I look for the insights that I can use. Mm. For health, how do you maintain your physical health? You travel a lot with speaking and you're very active. You got your businesses going. How do you keep your health in top shape? I exercise four to six times a week. Uh, my son, uh, who is 20, is a gym rat. He, uh, I never, ever did look like him, nor will I ever look like him. But uh, he's very good at helping me design a program that gives me maximum benefit, given my goals. You don't have time to exercise. You make time. And it's harder to do on the road. But, you know, one of the things I talk about in my book, The Potential Principle, is uh, a little bit's better than nothing. And I'm pretty disciplined to work out, you know, four to six times a week, cardio as well as weights. But even if I'm on the road and I can't do a great workout, I figure a, a half-baked workout is better than no workout. That's so true. What's your main motivation for continuing to hustle to the max of your potential? I'm not calling you old at all. Okay. All due respect. <laughs> no. But, I call myself I mean? old. I don't feel old, by the way. Nobody ever feels old. You know, you can be 90 and you don't feel old. You look in the mirror and you go, I'm old. But yeah, what still motivates you? What, what's getting you, back, getting you out of bed in the morning to keep doing what you do? Well, you know, I, I can remember being 26 and you knew there was a runway of life, but you didn't see the end of it. You get to be my age, you, you start to see in the distance that end. Now, of course, anybody's runway can be cut short by tragedy. But the reality is we all hope we live to be old. But the reality is that not everybody does. So you get this sense, uh, you get this sense of, again, not, not running scared, but just wanting to make the most of the moments, knowing that uh, we don't know how many we have. I like to combine making money with making meaning. It's easy to make money. It's easy to make meaning. I think it's a, a little trickier to find something that you can do that reimburses you well, that pays you well, but you still feel good about it. And, and that's one of the thing by, things I, I like about millennials and everybody has all these, you know, I, I'm not a big fan of the, the generational differences. I think they can be helpful, but I prefer to focus on what we have in common. Millennials, uh, 87% would rather do meaningful work, purposeful work than be recognized for the work they do. And that's pretty cool because, you know, I'm a baby boomer and I was kid around and go, you know, pay us enough money, we'll sell our souls, right? We'll do uh, whatever as long as you pay us well. So I admire the fact that younger generations uh, have consciously started to to look at putting, making sure that the, there's not this false dichotomy between making money and making meaning. Great quote too, making money and making meaning. You probably have a huge list, but go ahead and share your three most influential books and why. The first one doesn't change, and I, I hate to be cliche, but as a person of faith, the Bible for me is foundational. Uh, I try to read it regularly. That That's important. But then if you go to two books, one fiction, one nonfiction, a book that really impacted me many years ago is a book called Future Perfect by Stan Davis. And it was, and the reason it impacted me today, like most books that are very timely, a timely book becomes pretty dated. I always try to write books that are principle-based and use as few stories that are connected to a particular point in time. Because if I write about what happened in 2004 and you read it in 2020, you're like, oh man. But uh, Stan Davis was the first writer business guy that showed me you could get really original, really creative about how you thought about business. And that book was just pure magic for me. It was just one of the great motivations for, for my career to be uh, uh, hopefully a more innovative, edgier, creative thinker. There is a book that I've always loved. I don't know exactly why, but I have a clue. It's called uh, Peace Like a River by Leif Anger. And that book has got a, a really heartwarming plot, but it's uh, 
you know, I, I don't write fiction. Fiction is very different, very hard. I, Peace Like a River is just such beautiful prose. And the imagery is so amazing that that to this day, having read, you know, anywhere from 50 to 100 books a year for most of my life, that that book stands out as uh, one of my favorites. So the Bible, Future Perfect by Stan Davis and uh, Peace Like a River by Lee Finger. Mm, thank you for sharing those. You talk about bringing love to your work. Go ahead into that, just what that might look like. Yeah, I call it. I call it. Yeah, I call it the three loves. I mean, it's the ideal, and that is, you love what you do, you love who you do it with, and you love who you do it for. And that seems pretty simple on the surface, but the nuance is number one: you, you love what you do when it's hard, not when it's easy. And I know that sounds weird, but you enjoy what you do when it's easy. Most achievers, the kind of people that are listening to this podcast, they get turned on by the challenge. People who are are mediocre and have no goals to improve, they just get annoyed. But when you go to a retirement party, listen to what people talk about. They'll talk about all the fun they had, but they get serious and they talk about some real setback or some some devastating circumstance that they were able to overcome. And that's where they have their great source of, of pride and love. So, you know, love what you do even when it's hard because that's where you, you learn to love it. Love who you do it with. And it doesn't mean you have to like everybody on your team because that's the big myth. Like is an emotion. Love is a behavior. Emotions are autonomous. Well, I stand up to speak. Some woman looks at me and says, that looks like my ex-husband. I hate him. And as a result, she transfers that to me. <laughs> I can't do anything about that. And by the way, she didn't choose to dislike me. It was just an emotion was triggered, right? Well, you don't have to want to drink beer with everybody you work with after work. But I say love is based on the knowledge that everybody is pulling in the same direction and is, and is committed to the success of the organization and the client as you are. And I can deal with a great difference of opinion or worldview or politics or all those things if we have a unifying vision for what we're trying to do and why we're trying to do it. And then finally, it's obvious customers like to be loved. I mean, they can spend their money anywhere. But the reality is the only thing you have less of than disposable income is disposable time. All business is personal. Don't ever buy that crap about business. It's not personal. It's business. Hey, if I'm giving you my time and money, there's not much more personal we could get, right? I mean, that's pretty personal. So I'll say, you know, love the people who choose to do business with you. If you can't love them, don't do business with them. If they're, if they're abusive, if they're unpleasant, cut them loose. Send them to a competitor that deserves bad customers. But, you know, if you love what you do and you love who you do it with and you love who you do it for, that really kind of reverse engineering is what the book The Fred Factor is about. Mm. I love that. Yeah. You know, inclining your heart. So example, the woman at hypothetically, a woman sees you get up to speak. Oh, you remind me of somebody I dislike and therefore I tune out. Well, yeah. yeah. And you know what? And, and by the way, I'm, I'm not even I'm not even upset with a woman. I would hope perhaps she would rethink that, you know, at a, because but the problem is, Jonathan, a lot of people are on autopilot. They don't they don't ask if the conclusion they've drawn is, is correct. I tell people if you if you daydream during my speech, I won't be offended. And, but just choose to daydream. Don't do it accidentally. And, and if you listen to me, don't let me trick you. Somebody says, oh, man, I, I didn't even want to listen to the guy. And the guy was so good, he, he made me listen. Well, intentionality, I have come to believe after these many years, is the, the, the one characteristic all successful leaders and great people have in common. Nobody gets better with age accidentally except wine. Wine gets better with age and wine doesn't try. But the rest of us, you know, we have to try to get better. And that means we got to be intentional. People say, you know, what's what do all great people have in common? I don't know. I've known great people that did it backwards and, and violated every rule in the book. However, at the end of the day, they were intentional. Hmm. Yes. So speaking on intentional, if you had 60 seconds with your 30-year-old self, what would you tell them to do and what would you tell them not to do? Well, I'm going to take a little different approach. I, I wouldn't advise, advise one way or the other because who I am today at 59 – if I changed one thing, whether it was something I did right or something I did wrong, I wouldn't be who I am today. So I'm not a big believer in a variation of that is, you know, what would you change or what would you do differently? I think I probably admonish myself to pay attention. I mean, I think that's good advice for anybody at any age. Like we've been talking about throughout this time, it's so easy to get distracted and, and get off course. But I probably wouldn't have said much of anything because I might have set up an expectation that made me do something different. Now, at a very practical level, 
I would have said, don't be a knucklehead in the relationships. You know, I was single till I was 37. I was a real dumbass when it came to a lot of my relationships. And frankly, a lot of us are, <laughs> you know, how do we learn to do it right by doing it wrong? And and I have uh, any regrets I have are simply people I inadvertently hurt from being stupid. Uh, you know, there was no malice or, or, or rat intent. And so I might simply say, hey, be brave and courageous, but be kind because uh, you don't want to, uh, if you're a thinking person, if you're a kind person, if you have a heart, you never want to intentionally hurt others. Absolutely. I find that being kind has to be very intentional because even just being proactive, driven, motivated, (laughs) inspired, you tend to like bulldoze things and you don't realize it until later when people are like, Hey, uh, by the way, uh, we're not friends anymore or whatever it may be. And I'm yeah. like, wait, what? what? Well, you, you speak, well, the brain hijacks us. I mean, there's a part of the brain that's very task focused. And, you know, I'm not going to get into neuroscience, but you don't have to read much in neuroscience to say that your initial reaction by your brain is not conscious choice. that's always healthy. Uh, and, and, you know, perhaps, Jonathan, it sounds like you're wired like me. It's easy to say I'm just direct. But one person's direct is another person's rude. Yeah. I mean, you know, if you're listening and you like to if you if you like to respond to emails, you know, by just like saying send it to me by tomorrow, let me give you a clue. They're going to like you a lot better if you say, "Hey Bob, please send it to me by tomorrow." Yeah. And and it's a little thing. But, you know, you become so transactional, people are like, "What a jerk." <laughs> true. Yeah. Mark, it's been awesome having you here on the show. I really enjoyed speaking with you and learning from you. What's a project that you've been working on recently that you're excited about? Well, I just finished and launched a book, Potential Principle, The Potential Principle. If anybody's listening and, and they'd like to find out more, just go to potentialprinciple.com. Uh, I'm working on another book. And what's kind of interesting is I don't know what it's going to be. I've got about a half dozen ideas. And uh, I'm a little bit like Thomas Edison. Thomas Edison said, I never want to invent anything nobody wants to buy. And I never want to write a book nobody wants to read. So I, I want to make sure that uh, whatever my next book is, it will be engaging and helpful and uh, people will want to read it. Uh, beyond that, I, uh, I dabble in, uh, in investing in startups and things that uh, keep me learning. And uh, I still have two sons that I'm uh, deeply involved with their lives. So there's never a dull moment here in uh, Denver, Colorado, where I live. Fantastic. End to end on a high note for motorcycle riding. Is the weather still warm enough to be out riding? Here's a secret of Denver, Colorado. I never stored my motorcycles. You can ride year round here. Now you can't ride every day in the winter. You don't want to ride when there's ice and snow, but there are days in February, it'll be 65 degrees. And if you stored your bike, you're going to be kicking yourself. So right now you want to wear, uh, you want to wear rain gear, you want to wear uh, leathers, but you could still ride. Fantastic. Mark, thank you so much for sharing your amazing journey on the Heart Healthy Hustle. I know my audience will be inspired by your story and all the actionable pieces of advice. Well, it's been my pleasure. Thank you. You do a great interview. Not everybody does. I'm kind of, my eyeballs are bleeding from podcasts and some of them are so boring, you know, but yours is, is excellent and I appreciate your professionalism. You'll only get better. And if we can down the road, you know, once things are rolling, you want to revisit and do another one someday, let me know. Thank you for listening to the Heart Healthy Hustle podcast. If you made it to the end of this episode, I want to say thank you. And also, I want you to ask yourself why. What about this episode really stood out to you? I want to challenge you to take action on that thing. If you enjoyed this episode, I'd really appreciate your time and consideration to go ahead and leave a helpful review in iTunes. So it really helps the podcast grow and we can impact even more people who need this. Thank you guys for all of your support. And I will see you in the next episode.